Lecture 8, The L.A. School. Uh, this is a view of Los Angeles. Uh, it started uh, over here. Oh, look, I can see my cursor. Uh, and it moved on, it grew out from central Los Angeles uh, across the valleys uh, to the east uh, and to the south and became what is better known as Southern California. Um, but we also still call it a city uh, because that's a handy word. And we call it Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles, for most of the history that uh, courses like this look at and that architects are interested in, was a bizarre aberration. Uh, we would think of cities acting like Paris, London, Berlin, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, uh, Chicago, and New York on this continent. Uh, we don't think of cities uh, starting uh, in multiple centers and developing this polynucleic, multiple-centered pattern. And this was the aberration uh, for most of the 20th century, and it was architect Rainer Banham that uh, looked at it and predicted that actually this uh, aberration of the 20th century is more likely to be a pattern that the rest of the world uh, develops along uh, moving forward into the future. This. And uh, it's comparable in size size of economy, geographic size, population size, uh, with uh, the Randstad, uh, which is the circle of cities in the most populated area of the Netherlands, uh, which we used to call Holland. Uh, and you can see, I have to trick it by going over to another software, um, the, you see Rotterdam down here, Amsterdam up here, uh, Utrecht, uh, The Hague, uh, Harlem, uh, all of these rings of cities surrounding an agricultural heartland. Uh, and the national rail system, shown in red, is the mechanism by which the country is connected. Yes, there are highways, but their capacity is so much lower than the rail system that um, the bicycle-loving Dutch uh, don't use it that much. Uh, in contrast, um, Moving back to L.A., we see the rail system that was the original armature around which uh, the, the urban centers of uh, the Southern California L.A. basin formed around, but now the freeways carry a much larger uh, amount of uh, traffic, both human and cargo, uh, than was ever possible um, that, than the rails. But this wasn't always the case. Uh, the, the Netherlands, Holland, and Los Angeles were, used to be very much alike in the 1920s, as was uh, presented in a prior lecture. Uh, Los Angeles actually had one of the most vast and extensive uh, mass transit systems in the world based on real estate development as the financial mechanism for um, uh, connecting and integrating housing, land uses, and transportation. The miracle that made Los Angeles possible started with water. Uh, digging tunnels uh, and canals uh, like the Romans to bring water across from the mountains, uh, across the desert to Los Angeles that made it um, inhabitable. The palm trees uh, were never there until the water came and then it became part of a real estate development mythology promoted around the country, uh, inspiring people to come live the California dream, which was, of course, the archetype for the uh, American dream uh, that has gone overseas, as we saw last week. And so uh, the, the logic of the streetcar suburb grid, uh, putting streetcars uh, within walking distance of every home and linking it to downtown through networks, uh, was the logic that launched the Los Angeles miracle uh, fed by water and then um, and here's a portrayal of not just the local streetcar lines uh, but the larger railway systems uh, then the discovery of oil in California uh, which led to um, a multi 
uh, faceted boom, an economic boom, a manufacturing boom, uh, an automobility boom, a suburban development boom, um, the real estate boom, uh, and now you see Burbank uh, as typical of the fabric of Los Angeles and increasingly the, the growing cities around the world. Uh, the miracle of the modern uh, conveniences of the technological shift and the architectural packaging with which that was wrapped up uh, became the defining characteristics of winners and losers. Um, now it's uh, changed a bit uh, with winners and losers not defined uh, solely by cars and homes but also by other things. Um, the, the Chicago school, uh, we saw um, the Van Tonen, um, uh economic model of concentric circles when we looked at Chicago of uh, and this is uh, dubbed here the most famous diagram in social science where uh, wealth and uh, is concentrated at the center uh, and moving out in zones and rings uh, and disrupted by these uh, belts of poverty um, along the way but really as a, a, a nuclear uh, as in has a very solid nucleus type of development um, at the center and moving out in rings of lower uh, values out towards um, the increasing value of the commuter zones uh, out at the edge of the ring. In uh, Los Angeles it's a polynucleic uh, model where there are multiple centers and the different zones, uh, because of the operation of the grid, and in this case it's a, a grid of high-speed roadways, um, it starts to break apart uh, in terms of its patterning. And where any point on the grid can either start to develop uh, along a downward path or an upward path. And that those uh, zones get hardened edges um, as fear increases. And so this is the diagram from uh, Mike Davis, uh, the author of the reading, uh, an excerpt from The City of Quartz, a portrayal of Los Angeles in the 1990s as the, or the early 1990s when it was published, as uh, a formal spatial arrangement characteristic of fear and how fear drives the formal spatial arrangements of architecture and urban form and transportation networks in Los Angeles. And the push out towards the, the edge uh, through automobility, um, Dolores Hayden wrote, uh, published uh, a fascinating book uh, characterizing this uh, American automobile landscape of fear. Um, and these are snout houses characterized by the, the tucking away of front entries, um, almost like a defensive strategy, tucked in between garages. Um, that stick out as the snout of the house uh, along the public face. Um, uh, here's a landscape being prepared. Uh, the economic value is being increased by the promise, as we saw in Dubai, the promise of imminent growth and the credibility, adding to the cred credibility that this property will be worth more in 10 years than it is now, which is all you need to extract wealth from it. And these types of patterns are laid down across the landscape whether or not the houses are ever built. Their primary function, first and foremost, is to uh, generate uh, a compelling story of imminent demand. Uh, whether that demand ever materializes or not, all you have to do is convince someone that it might, uh, enough to buy it. If and when it does appear, um, you see the tiny percentage, and we're going to be looking at that, the tiny percentage of high-income uh, consumers, uh, increasingly even in the United States, a uh, tiny percentage, uh, it's going, it's actually a shrinking, uh, cutting edge uh, rather than an expanding one. Uh, it's expanding in terms of uh, access to wealth, but decreasing in terms of numbers of participants. Uh, but the significance and the distortion of the market uh, by these tiny minority of spenders um, 
in inflates the costs for everyone in society. Uh, it also consumes a disproportionate amount of the landscape because of the size of these uh, mansions. And uh, these edges of development uh, soon uh, give way to further development. So you might buy a house on the edge overlooking the prairie, but soon find it buried within um, a larger expansion. And at the edges, quite interesting, uh, back to the idea of water and the importance of water, uh, it turns immediately into desert uh, as soon as you shut off the spigot uh, and uh, stop the sprinkler, the irrigation systems from operating. Um, we're seeing that in Detroit where one-third of the houses are abandoned and they very quickly fall uh, to the ground, burn down to the ground, and nature takes over in a quite picturesque way, stunning way sometimes. Um, you see these types of landscapes. Uh, Hayden calls this the, the pig and the python um, after the little prince image of the hat, which is actually the, uh, the boa constrictor that has swallowed an elephant. Uh, but here's the pig and the python, the, the sprawling shopping mall surrounded by uh, the high-speed roadway. Uh, and similar LA type fabrics that uh, Rem Kohlhaas has labeled uh, junk space. You move and Margaret Crawford has written very uh, uh, movingly and vividly on how the American dream as manifest in, in Southern California is to uh, purchase your way into a gated enclave of irrigated landscaping, single-family housing of uh, similar um, socioeconomic, uh, non-threatening uh, cohabitants, uh, and stepping out of your bubble uh, into your uh, portable bubble of steel and glass. Um, uh, I call it Mies on wheels. Uh, it's a piece of architecture of steel and glass uh, on rubber tires that you that can take you from one enclave to the next. Uh, and so you move from your gated enclave uh, into your car, your air-conditioned, leather-seated, uh, quadraphonic stereo, uh, internet-connected uh, living room on wheels, uh, pass through the the junk space of whatever is left over uh, after these luxury enclaves are carved out of it to another luxury enclave for work. It could be a glass and steel tower downtown uh, where you enter through a concrete bunker in the basement uh, with a gate uh, and you go up your elevator uh, or to an entertainment zone, um, Disneyland type uh, enclave where similarly you park and enter uh, this strange uh, simulacra of, uh, of an entertainment architecture and space. Here's another view of what happens at the edge where the irrigation stops. Um, and this takes us to, um, uh, there's a succession uh, that leads us to Los Angeles, uh, but also beyond Los Angeles. Uh, once you've uh, experienced the possibilities of capturing water, feeding it to a desert place, making an oasis out of it, and uh, rapidly expanding its real estate possibilities. Uh, this is Lake Mead, uh, just outside of Las Vegas. Uh, because of this water supply and electrical supply, it became possible to feed water to what became the fastest growing uh, urban enclave of the United States uh, during the last half of the 20th century, also the location of the biggest uh, drop in housing prices uh, after the 2008 uh, market crash, bubble burst in, in the real estate market. Um, but until then, quite a stunning uh, increase in the volume of housing and uh, the expansion of the population all around this type of simulacra simulation of, uh, according to Baudrillard, the uh, French philosopher who popularized the idea of simulacra as a simulation of a lost reality that actually never was. Um, and here you see depictions of New York, New York, um, uh, Paris, 
uh, all kinds of things along the strip um, that is itself a very um, clear and powerful demonstration of the kind of architecture that forms along this type of roadway. And really, they are two sides of the same coin. Um, these huge footprint buildings, uh, air conditioning, uh, compressor farms on the roof, uh, tons of electrical input, surrounded by asphalt for parking, surrounded by a vast no man's land of roadways, uh, 110 degrees outside, 60 degrees inside. Um, take a sweater uh, and take it on and off a lot, uh, is our advice. So we have these types of junk space landscapes that are ripe for analysis. Uh, that, um, But the real idea here is the idea of the architecture of fortification. Uh, this is one of the uh, complexes uh, that Mike Davis focuses on, uh, the Bonaventure Hotel complex at Bunker Hill um, in downtown LA after the redevelopment of the place. The um, removal of people off of the ground plane uh, and up into elevated walkways uh, where they're safely removed from the possibilities of crime uh, because of the uh, surveillance cameras. The other uh, sense of paranoia, uh, it, the, well, this is one of the big themes, that the greater the distance between the wealthy and the poor, the consumer class and everybody else, the greater the degree of paranoia. And this was actually a, a, a well-intentioned uh, luxury development in Jakarta uh, where the idea is once you got in through the main gate of this gated uh, city, basically, of Lipo Karawachi, um, you were safe and uh, the, the armed guards and the small army could protect you uh, with that gate. But the people who moved there said, no, we want to live in smaller enclaves and forced the developer to install these fences internally within the community to make sure, um, well, not to make sure, just to reassure people that uh, if the outer fortress were infiltrated, uh, it wouldn't mean losing the entire uh, colony. Um, it sounds almost like um, a zombie apocalypse scenario, um, which in 98 it, it was to some extent, um, where pedestrians, uh, otherwise known as protesters, protesters tend to walk on foot. And so here we have this new arts complex uh, built after the 98 riots where um, you have a mass transit stop and the grand entrance to the arts complex. And it seems to make sense, except, wait, what is that fence doing there? Um, it seems, uh, where's the gate that goes from the bus stop into the complex? Well, you, you move your drone uh, helicopter up a little bit, and you, you notice now you can see the formal spatial arrangement better. And um, this is a continuous uh, fortress uh, barricade against pedestrians, including people taking mass transit, poor people take mass transit, rich people arrive by car, and um, proper Indonesians arrive by chauffeur-driven cars. So the car is becomes the elevator, takes you up to this level, drops off its passengers, and the chauffeur uh, then proceeds on down to the parking garage, uh, waiting for the call that the concert is over. And in order to uh, go from here to there, just in case your chauffeur has the night off, you have to walk uh, about uh, close to a mile um, this way uh, and then around the block to a vehicular entrance and then down the driveway back to this location. And maybe they will let you in if you dress properly. Um, and um, more of these spatial segregation, the fear, uh, the fortress mentality um, between the wealth, wealthy and uh, the rest, uh, the wealthy uh, few. Uh, here's actually the view I was looking for um, where the bus stop here, in order to go in, you have to actually go to this intersection, enter here and walk back this way. Maybe it's not quite a mile. Um, but the batteries on my drone copter were running out. Uh, 
so. And here's this photo. You've seen it before. You'll see it again. Um, the important thing in this photo, and this is going to be an idea that we look at um, in weeks to come, is less the extreme difference between this architecture and this architecture. Uh, it's the nature of the segregation of the two. Um, three or four or three or four dozen of the young men uh, of this neighborhood are hired to act as uh, the gun-toting security guards here uh, to make sure that wall is not breached. And it's the level of fear that is uh, entailed in this type of formal spatial arrangement. Uh, I know this is an, a tempting one to use as an analysis, but please don't. It's been done a lot. So because you have access through Facebook of the key video evidence, I want to save some time. You may have already seen this. Um, I suggest you look at it again. This time, pay close attention to these key points that I have uh, pulled out as uh, still images from the video. First, Hans Rosling's Gapminder talk, uh, where he represents the distribution of global income uh, by continent according to uh, this chart. And you see very clearly that there is a distinction between, um, there's still a distinction at this point, 1972, between the developing world and the developed world, uh, expressed as these two bumps of population. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that what is being portrayed here is the dollars per day of income uh, as uh, and then showing the number of people by the in the y-axis so the area under the curve is the number of people uh, we are not looking at the quantity of money and this is actually um, as much as I respect uh, Professor Rosling uh, he, I feel that and as much as I acknowledge that this is all true this mode of representing the situation uh, is very convenient for those who wish to uh, maintain or exacerbate the order of things as is vividly portrayed in uh, Robert Reich's um, video, uh, his film uh, Inequality for All, that this ignores actually the amount of money. Uh, it downplays the amount of money because of the logarithmic scale on the x-axis, but it also uh, eliminates the long tail that goes off to the right uh, a very long distance even on the logarithmic scale because some people are living on hundred thousand dollars a day and in terms of the amount of money uh, even though the number of people is very small the amount of money is so large and so what you'll notice uh, there seems to be a contradiction between um, the story being told in uh, Professor Rosling's uh, data visualization and the ones that go uh, with the uh, income inequality in America and global wealth inequality. Uh, but they are actually portraying the same data in different ways, uh, learning once again the lessons of data visualization that the story you tell and the lesson of this course, the story you tell depends a lot on how you portray the evidence, how you present the evidence. And so here we see the two bumps, um, very clear evidence that uh, there is no more uh, developing world and developed world. Those terms are largely uh, uh, out of, uh, not useful anymore. They're extinct. Um, it's instead third world, first world, living within the nation state. And so the nation state itself becomes increasingly less important as an indicator uh, as this video this is the key shot where the wealthiest 1% you've heard of them uh, have 40% of American wealth and 60% of the wealth is captured by the rest and even that is poorly distributed uh, very different from uh, what we assume to be true what we want to be true uh, and is reinforced, the fantasy is reinforced by the term the middle class. There is no middle uh, in the middle class, and uh, it looks awfully um, poor here. Um, 
and so the the and then this is more true to form this is again Rosling's data uh, where he breaks apart the the five quintiles so each dot within the country of South Africa is the lowest 20 percent income earners the next 20 to 40 percent 40 to 60 60 to 80 and the top 20 percent income earners distribute very wide swaths across uh, this chart and he emphasizes that the wealthiest 20 percent in South Africa compared with the poorest 20 percent in Uganda uh, represents a world of difference and the um, even though we continue to gather statistics according to these increasingly arbitrary designations of nation states the real story is told when you disaggregate that data um, and finally we get to the uh, data visualization uh, showing the wealth and poverty of the globe and we see this remarkable concentration of wealth uh, in the wealthiest two percent uh, so this is a tiny number of people here it's uh, the number 300 people uh, is given have the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of humanity um, or three billion people at that point um, way back when there was closer to six billion people um, and those three billion uh, we're about to get three billion more and those three billion will be guess which side of the this scale of those three billion will be on uh, and so what are the architectural manifestations of these conditions uh, it is uh, a condition of rising fear and anxiety it has been true throughout human history uh, that great uh, disparities of um, power and income uh, has led to uh, violence and there is reason for fear um, but the remarkable thing that Robert Reich points out in his evidence in his presentation is that uh, rather than the mythology of the trickle down that uh, job creators so-called uh, create jobs for a lot of people there's a lot of evidence that this rhetoric of job creation is yet another strategy for consolidation uh, and fortifying uh, the wealth uh, because of fears and the fears turn out to be irrational because the actual evidence indicates that uh, if you give a millionaire a million dollars, um, he or she invests it, and it doesn't really uh, make much of a difference uh, in the real economy of goods and services. Of uh, it doesn't circulate much. Uh, whereas if you give a million dollars to uh, people at the other end of the spectrum, they actually go out and spend that million dollars on things they need. And so the money, uh, there's a much greater multiplier effect for the million dollars invested in uh, the poor end of the spectrum. And it actually uh, does a much more effective job of stimulating a larger income, a larger economic growth, and uh, the more enlightened self-interest of the wealthiest Americans and the wealthiest uh, members of the human race would be to uh, promote and foster a greater, a more equitable income distribution. Uh, even if you uh, ignored the mechanisms of socialism, if you simply stimulated the economic mechanisms already at play and put more money into circulation through the uh, consumption uh, and spending of the poorest people in the world, the overall economy within nations and uh, around the world would actually grow at a faster rate and it would be a healthier type of growth it would be less speculative less volatile less about the exchange values that feed into bubbles and more about the real use values that we care about most as architects uh, so moving forward into the next topic we're going to look um, next week at informal settlements uh, specifically this week um, I'm tempted to say please don't use informal settlements as your evidence um, but I think what I'd rather say is go ahead use informal settlements as, as your evidence but please look at the um, architectural mechanisms of fear uh, the, the the walls between wealth and poverty the security measures 
the, uh, the war against public space, as Davis writes about it, those architectural uh, strategies that operate to undermine the uh, usefulness for the largest uh, swath of, the, of society uh, in the public spaces. And so this week, uh, you can look at um, architectural strategies of fear as much as you want, including those in informal settlements. Next week, we'll looking, be looking for evidence of some of the organic, positive uh, aspects of informal settlements. And so let's um, distribute our labors and attentions in that way.